Hey, everybody, just a quick audio check to make sure that you can hear me. So if you can, just put in the questions from audience or in the question panel. Uh, just let me know that you guys can hear uh, me. And we'll go ahead and give everyone uh, another three or so minutes to uh, log in. All right, uh, looks like audio is working. So I'm gonna go ahead and mute myself. Um, again, we'll get started about uh, uh, in another two or three minutes. Um, and until then, I'll, I'll, I'll be on mute. All right, that's pretty close to five minutes after. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, plus the number of views has uh, plateaued. So um, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Doug Otis. I'm the lead mechanical engineer at PDT. Uh, also have Matt Humrick 
on the line from Advitech Pacific. Um, and today's topic is going over combining simulation um, with added manufacturing. Um, and so I'll be responsible for kind of going over uh, the, the basics of what uh, ANSYS has to offer as far as added manufacturing um, from the topology optimization and material uh, characterization side of things. Um, and then Matt is has been kind enough to uh, prepare a few slides going over a trade study over a torque arm, so actual um, in field use, um, as well as some uh, ANSYS functionality. Um, as far as a little bit of housekeeping, everyone will get a copy of PDF of these slides. Um, there will be a recording. Um, if you have questions, go ahead and type them in um, as we present it. We'll try to answer them um, as we go. So as far as the agenda, kind of ruined the surprise here. So we'll go over PDT, uh, what we can do as far as topology optimization and um, additive uh, simulations with Anantis. And then Matt will go over his trade study and then Q&A. So who is PDT? Founded in 1994 by four turbo uh, engineers based in Tempe, but uh, offices spread out all over the place. Uh, so I'm located in the Colorado office. P PDT as a whole is uh, based out of Tempe, uh, Arizona. Um, also have offices in New Mexico, Utah, um, and employees uh, spread out all over the place. As far as a business, we're split across numerical simulation, product development, and 3D printing. And so we're an ANSYS reseller. We're also a reseller for the Stratasys. Um, and on the simulation and 3, 3D printing uh, side of things, we, uh, are, we offer sales support and services uh, for those business units. On the numerical simulation uh, side of things, uh, we're an ANSYS Elite Channel Partner. We're a distributor for a uh, 1D thermodynamic solver named Flonex. Um, and we also partner with vendors to provide HPC compute uh, solutions. We provide frontline technical support to all of our customers, essentially in the Southwest US. It's kind of grown out a little bit, but um, kind of traditionally the four corner core four corners areas plus Texas, California, and some uh, other places. Uh, we also provide uh, training and mentoring services, um, essentially anywhere. Um, we also have a consulting group to provide numerical simulation services, both as an overflow or if just the expertise isn't in-house. And so uh, uh, stress dynamics, uh, fluid flow, or CFD, electromagnetics, both high and low frequency, um, or combining those physics together. Um, again, we're ba originally based in the Four Corners area, but you see that the uh, map is kind of spread out uh, beyond that. We have uh, employees scattered all over the place um, across the U.S. Um, and we're a strong, uh, strong technical partner. So very customer focused, uh, uh, focused on making sure it's a win-win scenario to make sure that you know, the software is doing what you want. Uh, technically very strong, a lot of industry experience, uh, uh, not just the turbo machinery, but turbo machinery arena, but um, in other fields as well. Um, and yeah. All right, so first we're going to go over what ANSYS has to offer as far as topology optimization and the additive uh, uh, simulation. So traditional forms of manufacturing and design are really more of a subtractive method. So, uh, you know, you start with a block of metal, you use, uh, you know, a mill, a lathe, whatever, whatever you want to remove material um, in order to get to a your design, and so essentially just a bunch of Boolean operations. And so this works rather well. Um, it lets experience kind of drive how the design looks. Um, certain things can or can't be manufactured using this. Um, and so there's a limitation to what we can make or what is possible to make, you know, for different uh, scenarios. And so virtual topology is more of a process where we're letting the simulation or the physics drive how our design should look. And so we essentially start with a domain. We start with some boundary conditions that represent, you know, a load occurs here and it has to be reacted out here. What is the best design based off of a set of criteria? Um, and so 
um, you know, we, the, the benefit to doing this is you can get some very organic looking shapes and where this shines is in the additive manufacturing. And so um, some of the, you know, obviously the shapes that you can get that would be, you know, extremely difficult, if not impossible to manufacture from a subtractive standpoint. And so 3D printing offers um, a host of options um, as far as opening up kind of the design template. And so why do it? Um, you get improved product design. You're not wasting material or making something heavier than it needs to be. Um, and new material properties as far as, you know, additive manufacturing. And, you know, rather than letting what has been done in the past drive your design, you can make something that works specifically for a use case. Kind of going over, you know, the, the organizing, the hierarchy of um, optimization, you know, way back when, you know, you'd have some type of structure and we're just trying to optimize the, the size. So trying, you know, we're going to make something, we know the shape it's going to be. We just need to figure out what's the, essentially the right size a member needs to be to transmit the load. So the top, top uh, picture right there is you know, circular tubing, just constant cross section. We're just going to make sure that the, the size is right in order to carry the load based off of whatever constraints we have on our system. Uh, after that, we can start to optimize the shape. And so we're still using that same truss structure. And really all we're doing is rather than using a constant cross section or you know, a fairly uniform cross section, we're gonna tailor the shape of those load carrying members um, based off of our constraints. Topology optimization doesn't use that same, uh, you know, we're not bound by that truss structure that you see in the first two. We know that we have to get to the left side of the cantilever beam. We know the load exists on the right side. And so topology optimization tells you where material needs to be within that design space in order to meet the same constraints. On top of that, we can go into um, even more kind of detailed or, or uh, specific optimization routines where we can actually hollow out the inside of a part and replace it with a lattice structure. And we can run a simulation in order to tell us how thick or what the density of those uh, lattice members should be based off of, you know, where is my load, where is my constraint, uh, where is a, a, a low stress environment. And so um, all, all of this is uh, stress-based. And so again, we're asking the solver to figure out where can I remove material, where should my thicker versus a thinner um, lattice structure uh, exist. And so this is done essentially the exact same way of you know, running a topology optimization, except all we're doing is we're specifying which faces need to be kept. Um, it runs through based off of the uh, lattice structure that we picked. So there's a list of it's uh, eight or more uh, lattice structures that it, it can represent. From that, we can create a density field. And uh, with that density field using space claim, we can hollow out our part and essentially make it a honeycomb-like structure, um, depending on the, the, the lattice structure you're using, and, and send that to print. So kind of just going through and showing you know, the varying density of our lattice structure. So depending on what the solver spits out, we'll get thin lattice members in some parts and thick in the other. And so as far as, you know, the, the uh, optimization routine, we start out with a finite element simulation that represents where our structure is. Are, are located, uh, where our constraints are located, where our loads exist. Uh, we determine what the shape should be based off of uh, certain criteria. So, you know, whether it's maximum stress, trying to maximize our stiffness, um, we can also operate off of natural frequencies or uh, thermal responses, that kind of stuff. And then we have constraints based off of, you know, both stress, deformation, natural frequency. And so, again, we're just letting the solver and the physics drive what our shape should actually look like rather than uh, assuming our part needs to look like this based off of what's been done in the past. 
So after you have your optimized solution, the output of that um, would be an STL and uh, lovely animations. So there's a lot of tools that ANSYS has as far as the additive side of the house. And so all of these tools are essentially focused on uh, powder bed fusion uh, metal printing. And so um, some of these, if you, uh, you, you could argue, you could make it work for some polymer um, uh, printing. But again, the, the primary focus of this is on the metal printing side of things. And so we have tools to help aid in the design for additive manufacturing and setting up your build, simulating the actual build process, analyzing the material, uh, essentially the, the characteristics of your uh, printed metal, um, capturing the you know, thermal history from your powder bed fusion machine and, and uh, essentially using that to validate or qualify uh, whether or not that, that met your spec um, and, and going from there. All right, so as far as uh, all the different tools that we have available, um, so we have design for additive manufacturing, so that's essentially the, the topology optimization, uh, the latticing um, and light weighting. At the build setup, we have the ability to uh, repair fi STL files, uh, create support structures, uh, and then uh, essentially drive, um, you know, properly orient our part on our build plate. Um, and I'll go over a few of these uh, uh, in later slides. So again, the, the topology optimization or the additive printing world process starts with an over-designed part or something that has been made with traditional manufacturing uh, methods. We run a topology optimization study. Uh, we then take that uh, optimized STL, run a simulation to verify the behavior, and then we can figure out how do we want to Orient, how do we want to support, uh, simulate how it's printed to understand whether or not we need to perform heat treatment cycles, um, understand what type of um, just material properties we'll have based off of build parameters, and um, optimize it off of the entire essentially life, lifetime uh, manu uh, manufacturing of the part. As far as topology optimization, there's two basic approaches. So we have a density-based method. That's what most, I'd say that's what most uh, uh, optimizing tool, tools use. We also have a level set method. So um, they both essentially give you the same thing. Um, from a use case, the level set typically gives you a much cleaner, uh, more uh, uh, less subject to um, spikiness or uh, a lot of distortion in the STL. Um, and over time, you know, each, each rev, um, the two methods essentially uh, have more and more overlap. Um, really, the, the big limitation right now is just in the different manufacturing uh, requirements um, uh, but between the two. Uh, but essentially, there's two different ways to go about it. One will essentially go through and turn elements on and off and track your response. The other one uses... Um, more kind of numerical method to uh, def better define the boundaries that result in essentially a cleaner looking shape. So just kind of showing the two, you can see uh, the, the level set uh, tends to give you a cleaner representation. The SIP method or the density-based method, uh, it, you can get there. It just requires a little bit more uh, post-processing on uh, the STL side. Um, after you have your STL, we can use space claim, and there's a tool in there called Additive Prep. This is this is not a numerical simulation, but this is essentially a rules-based approximation of, you know, how should I orient my part on my build plate, and that'll tell me, you know, which uh, orientations will need more or less support, which are which orientations are more or less prone to out-of-plane distortion. Uh, which are more or less, uh, you know, which orientations are faster or slower to build. So I can create these composite heat maps that tell me how I can orient my part so that I can minimize distortion, minimize uh, the amount of support material I need, um, and, and speed up the print, and also you know, stack multiple parts on that build plate. 
And so within additive prep, you load your parts, specify your build envelope, uh, optimize your orientation, create your supports within there. Um, and then we could actually build or generate the build file for certain uh, 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 powder bed fusion machines. All right, so that handles my portion of this. Um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Matt to discuss an actual uh, use case within, uh, within industry. And so I'll go ahead and mute myself. Take it over, Matt. Thank you, Doug. Um, my name is Matt Helmerich. I'm the engineering manager at Adam Tech Pacific, uh, which is an engineering consulting business with extensive experience in both the aerospace and defense industries. Uh, both commercial and military sectors. Uh, we work on uh, various parts uh, from a variety of products, including gas turbine engines, aircraft, and space vehicles. Um, as an engineering services provider, we heavily utilize CAE solutions uh, to support our customers through the full product creation cycle. Um, generally, our software requirements are driven by our customer. Uh, usually right down to the specific version of the software we use. Uh, therefore, we support all CAD platforms um, from the very latest version to versions dating back 10 years or more ago to support legacy programs. Um, as far as simulation, uh, we heavily utilize both uh, ANSYS and uh, CMAP X NASTRAN software. Uh, for ANSYS Mechanical, um, as Doug kind of alluded to, it's a full multi-physics suite. Uh, so there's a lot of capabilities that uh, you know, we, we don't even use. Um, primarily, we use ANSYS for doing static and dynamic structural and thermal analysis, as well as the topology optimization. Um, some of the reasons why we use ANSYS, uh, again, customer requirements. Uh, there's specific customers or even uh, industry sectors that uh, heavily utilize ANSYS, uh, for example, the gas turbine engine industry. Um, another reason we use it is for the powerful scripting uh, APDL language. Um, this allows us to automate uh, a lot of routine tasks that uh, saves us a lot of time. Um, I've written APDL macros that, you know, basically with one click, it can uh, import the geometry, prep the geometry, mesh it, uh, pull in loads, you know, map thermal loads from a separate thermal analysis, read in uh, a pressure map for an airfoil from a text file, um, apply the remainder of the loads, boundary conditions, uh, run the analysis, and even um, automate all the post-processing. Um, it creates all the uh, stress plots and images, so basically, you know, a one-click automated routine. Um, <clears throat> it also helps, uh, especially with the Workbench product, to streamline your workflow. Uh, it helps simplify um, work, you know, getting your geometry from CAD into the analysis package and back again. And again, it just helps with streamlining that uh, multi-physics integration. <clears throat> One of the projects um, that we're working on is helping a customer adapt a legacy gas turbine engine family um, that originally was intended for some marine applications uh, to a new market opportunity in power generation. Um, there were several challenges with this project, including overcoming part obsolescence, as some of these engines date back to the 1950s. Um, Another task was to reduce cost, uh, either through redesigning parts uh, or using new technologies uh, like additive manufacturing. And we also had to redesign parts or entire engine modules uh, to meet new exhaust emissions requirements. Uh, as part of that project, um, we had already transitioned some parts over to additive manufacturing. Uh, one part in particular was the uh, combustor swirlers, which uh, help mix the air and fuel mixture in the combustor. Uh, these are fairly complex 
castings uh, historically, but since these engines are fairly low uh, volume production, um, to the tooling for the casting would be cost prohibitive, and uh, the lead time was also uh, fairly long. So it was a, a good target for uh, additive manufacturing. Um, along with that, we wanted to demonstrate to our customer and our other customers the benefits of combining a technology like topology optimization uh, with additive manufacturing. Um, as Doug already showed in some of his slides, uh, the topology optimization um, can produce some rather organic shapes that cannot be produced uh, with traditional manufacturing methods. So really the optimization and additive manufacturing often go hand in hand. Um, the part that we chose for this trade study is shown in that little black box there in the image. Uh, it's a torque arm that connects a linear actuator, which is the uh, green box there at the top, to a bell crank assembly that adjusts the inlet guide vanes for the compressor section of this gas turbine engine. Um, the reason we chose this part is for its simplicity. It's just a beam with a transverse load applied. And that would allow us to compare the optimized solution to what you would predict from a traditional hand calculation. Uh, the goals uh, were just to minimize the weight of the part. And we also had to match the stiffness of the original part so that um, for the same stroke of the linear actuator, um, you got the same position of the inlet guide vanes. One of the advantages um, of using ANSYS for the topology optimization is that um, it can work with an entire assembly of parts. Uh, so for this uh, model, you know, we can see both of the engine mounts, the bell crank assembly, as well as the torque arm, uh, all in the simulation. You can also utilize things like surface-to-surface -surface contacts. Um, so in this case, we have contact elements uh, where the journal bearings are, uh, as well as the uh, interface between the torque arm and the shaft, and up where the, uh, the linear actuator attaches to this link plate through the link pin. <clears throat> and uh, being able to utilize a full assembly is going to become is going to be important, which you'll see here in a minute. Um, for those who haven't done an optimization analysis before, I'll just go through the basic steps here really quickly. Um, to start with, um, you create your model just like you would any structural model. You know, you go through meshing, defining your contacts, setting up your materials, defining your loads and boundary conditions. Uh, from there, you get into the specific steps of the optimization. Um, the first thing you do is to define your optimization region. So in this case, obviously, we have multiple parts here cut up into multiple volumes. So you can actually go in and select specific volumes where you want the optimization algorithm to focus. So in this case, obviously, um, we're only looking at the torque arm and uh, not, nothing from the bell crank assembly as far as the optimization goes. Um, as part of that, you can also define specific surfaces um, to exclude from the optimization. Um, so often these will be uh, interfaces with other parts. So for our torque arm here, um, obviously there's a surface where it uh, interfaces with the shaft at one end. So those uh, internal surfaces were excluded as well as the, uh, the link pin uh, interface hole uh, at the other end. Um, so that way the the algorithm will not remove material from those specific surfaces. Uh, the next step is to define your goal or objective. Um, in most cases, that will probably be to uh, minimize weight, as it is here. And then you'll need to set up uh, one or more response constraints. So obviously, if you go in here and tell it to minimize your weight and tell it nothing else, then it's just going to remove everything. You'll get, get nothing at the end. So the uh, constraints uh, put uh, a lower limit on 
how much material can be removed. Uh, so this is a fairly simple uh, part. So the only constraint here is a von Mises stress constraint that says that uh, you can't uh, have stress exceed the, the yield stress of the material, uh, which in this case is a stainless steel. Uh, there's several other uh, response constraints uh, that you can uh, include. Um, in anything from reaction force constraints to displacement constraints. You know, for example, if you had this part couldn't exceed a certain amount of deflection. Um, there's also geometric constraints. Uh, for example, you can enforce symmetry about a specific plane, or if you are if you know you're targeting a specific you know manufacturing method, uh, there's some extrusion constraints and things like that that you can also apply to uh, sort of tailor uh, the optimization output. Some things to consider, um, the initial volume that you start with, you kind of want to start with uh, sort of a, a blank block, if you will. Um, that way you allow the optimization routine as much freedom as possible to come up with the optimum solution. Um, if you, base, if you um, already have uh, a well-defined part, and then you try to optimize it, um, you're just limiting uh, the solution space for the, for the algorithm. So uh, in this case, you can see that my torque arm is just a, a solid rectangular block, and I'm going to allow the algorithm to figure out uh, within that volume uh, what the optimum solution is. Uh, you also have to pay close attention to your mesh density. Um, obviously, the finer your mesh, the more closely your optimized part will look to your sort of final machine part or manufactured part. Um, however, you do have to keep um, the mesh size uh, reasonable in terms of your compute time because you are basically running a series of uh, iterative analyses. Uh, so your solution time uh, can go up pretty substantially if your mesh is too refined. So after running the optimization analysis, um, you get the output is basically these images here at the bottom. And you can see there the uh, kind of brown, brown surfaces are areas where the material was removed from the original block. And you can see how you get, you know, again, a very sort of organic um, sort of alias shape um, that is highly suggestive of the final part, but not necessarily, you know, ready to go straight to manufacturing. Uh, so in this case, um, what I did was I exported this uh, geometry into a CAD package, and then I used that as a guide to basically create a, uh, a clean set of geometry um, that we could then manufacture. So after uh, massaging that in the CAD program, I brought the geometry back into Andes Mechanical, which is the model here in the upper right corner. Um, and then what we do here is just run another structural analysis to, again, validate that um, our final massage design here um, still meets our design goals. So this is, uh, you can see a comparison of the original, you know, simple design here in the upper left corner to our final optimized design. Um, there's several things that um, you can see that resulted that compare um, with what you would get from your traditional hand calculation. Um, the overall shape is an I-beam, which again is very efficient for carrying that uh, transverse bending load. We can also see that the I-beam flanges are tapered. They're thicker at the base than they are towards the tip. Um, if you go back here one slide, you can see uh, in the optimized uh, shape here that uh, that is a feature that shows up there. Um, there are some features that um, 
were not intuitive or would not be predicted from a hand calculation. And that is the asymmetric features, uh, particularly the, uh, the web and uh, some of the uh, cutouts in the web. And this goes back to being able to do the optimization analysis with an assembly of parts. If you were to just analyze the torque arm by itself, and for example, in the, uh, on the surfaces here that interface with the shaft, if you just put a fixed constraint there and you applied your load at the other end, um, the optimization analysis would uh, predict a perfectly symmetric part. But in reality, because you have the elasticity of the material, um, not only of the torque arm, but of the shaft itself, you don't get an even load distribution on um, that interface surface. And in the lower left corner of the uh, von Mises stress plot here, you can see um, how you have a very high peak stress um, along the inner edge uh, of that interface and almost no uh, stress in the, uh, the outer part of that surface. Uh, going back a slide here, again, you can see how the optimization routine um, basically removed almost all of the material around that outer portion of that shaft interface. Um, the interface surface itself was kept because I set that as a uh, exclusion zone, but all of the material around it uh, was basically re removed um, versus on the uh, inner portion, uh, it kept that material. <clears throat> it also changed the shape of the web so you can see how the web angles directly towards the uh, inner portion of the uh, shaft interface because that's where the load is traveling. Um, so the, ult the, the final part um, was able to show a 45% uh, reduction in weight and we were able to match the bending stiffness of the original parts exactly. So I think, you know, what this really shows is that the topology optimization can lead to sort of non-intuitive results. Um, that, you know, not only can improve you know, an existing design, but I think you can actually use the topology optimization as a design tool up front. So, you know, you can just feed it a block of material, let the algorithm run and see, um, you know, what it comes up with. And even if you don't necessarily use that final design going forward, um, it can um, give you some ideas and inform your final design as well as give you a better understanding of the load paths uh, through your parts, um, which again can help you come up with a, a better design. So with that, I guess we'll open it up to uh, questions. Let's go ahead and uh, type them in. So while people are uh, typing in their questions, um, another thing I can uh, mention is um, we, after we, we got our final shape, um, we did a few other things to get it ready for um, additive manufacturing. Um, so one thing to consider is that um, in most cases, 
the material properties um, of the additive parts are going to be orthotropic, um, where the, the strength is generally less in the build direction than it is in the in-plane directions. So for this part um, being uh, loaded in transverse bending, um, our build direction is across the width of the I-beam. So you can see in the upper right corner, um, we basically took one side uh, of the part and flattened it um, so that that would be the, the part that would sit on top of the build plate. Um, we also uh, removed as much material as we could from the web and made sure that all of these cutouts were normal to the build plate surface, um, again, to just minimize um, the amount of support structure um, that would be required to print this part. So it doesn't look like we have any questions yet. Um, Doug, did you want to wait a little longer or did you want y to? Yeah, proceed? yeah, I was, I was gonna, um, uh, I'm more than happy to keep the session open. I'll go through the last couple of slides, just um, a little unrelated to this, more of a answers general stuff. But again, if anyone has questions, type them in. Um, we uh, more than happy to, to answer anything. Um, just to go over, you know, Times are a little weird, <laughs> that's an understatement of the day. Um, and so just letting everyone know, um, you know, compute resources can be an issue. Um, things don't, you know, if you're running on a laptop uh, at home uh, versus having access to a server or anything like that in the office. Um, Ansys does have a cloud offering. Um, it's been uh, yeah, available for a few revs now. Each rev, we get a little bit better at you know, supporting uh, different features, different solvers, that kind of stuff. Um, and so uh, just letting everyone know it's built off of the Microsoft Azure platform. Um, and really it's HPC as easy as it should be. Um, and it essentially installs and it has a, um, an ACT plugin. Um, it operates off of uh, kind of a named account and uh, some elastic units. There are some changes uh, being worked on to, you know, kind of use your own license or, you know, some additional features uh, along the way. Um, and so just realize that you can use your local machine as the uh, pre and post setup. You can submit large jobs to the cloud um, and, you know, uh, evaluate your designs, uh, um, uh, you know, by solving on a much larger compute system without you having to uh, invest in that that resource or maintain it. Um, see, one question that just came in, and uh, ah, good, that was my last slide. Um, I think. Oh, last thing is that there's uh, also a 30 day, 30 day free trial for the cloud. Um, and so, if this is, you know, if you're running into compute issues where you can't solve as big of a model as you'd like, um, realize that you know there's there's ways to fix that. Um, and so, let's see. Uh, so, Matt, I don't know if you want to take a swing at the question of, of by reduction of weight ratio, is there any change in the stiffness of the object? Sure. Let me just uh, step back a few slides sure. here. Yeah. And so, yeah, the, the, the short answer is you can have it essentially uh, refine this uh, optimized shape based off of essentially any criteria that you can really think of. And so, I'll, I'll let Matt take over from there. Uh, so, yeah, so the question is, um, 
with the reduction in weight, was there any change in the stiffness? And the answer is no. We were able to match the stiffness within 1%. Um, one of the things that, um, well, one of the initial assumptions I made, um, obviously knowing that the, a very simple loading scenario here with the transverse load, um, obviously the height um, of the web was going to be an important driver. So that was one of the things that I did initially was increase the original volume, the height of this part, um, which is going to uh, increase the, the bending stiffness in that direction, um, which allows you to remove more material um, from within the volume itself. Um, so that way, uh, again, you're able to uh, minimize uh, your weight or otherwise maximize the amount of material you remove um, while still um, maximizing, or in this case, you know, matching that original bending stiffness. <clears throat> I guess that uh, kind of goes into another topic of, um, again, when you set up your topology optimization, um, there's things you can do by applying you know, various constraints or making assumptions about the initial volume of material that you provide the software um, and how that affects your final result. So, you know, you don't want to get into um, the practice of going into this with a design in mind because you're going to end up over constraining your optimization analysis to try and force it into your preconceived notion of what the part should look like. So really you want to go in and give it as much volume as you can to work with and utilize the fewest number of constraints on the part. So, you know, that might mean initially your initial run, you might get something that, um, it was a bit overly aggressive and removed material from areas that you know that you're going to need for the part to function, whether they're interfaces with other parts or something. So at that point, you could go in and then add um, a specific constraint or exclude a specific surface from the optimization run um, to, uh, to tailor your, to get a better output in the end. But um, you just don't want to get in the habit of applying too many constraints and forcing this into your preconceived idea of what the part should look like or, you know, what your company's design manual says you should have to do. I think that's a great point, Matt, of uh, not over-constraining. And the other nice thing you can do is, you know, so this, this is uh, kind of a nice arm in that, you know, it, the, the loading for it is pretty well dominated, at least by like a single use case. And so um, just wanted to point out that you could have multiple loading scenarios that all help to like drive what the overall shape can be. And so you can have thermal simulation, you can have you know, two or more structural simulations, you can have a natural frequency study. And so all of those, you can essentially specify drivers on that. And so, um, you know, this is, this is a, a, a really elegant use case for, you know, uh, a dominating like loading case. Um, but there is the ability to add um, a, a lot of different load considerations here. Um, all right, next question. Uh, can other types of constraints be applied with topology optimization, for example, maximizing surface area, uh, limiting deformation at a certain location, um, and from there. So as far as the, the deformation, that's, that's certainly uh, a, a constraint that you can apply. Um, and it can be, you know, if you wanted to, you can make kind of a composite constraint where it's essentially, if I wanted to know what the distance was between two points in my model during the optimization run, I could essentially tag two nodes and say, you know, I, I want to optimize off of this or, or constrain, constrain my design off of this. As far as the surface area, I'm not aware of one uh, for that. Um, I'm trying to think if there's a way that you could force it based off of some other uh, loads, but uh, off the top of my head, that's not an available constraint that, that, that I've seen. 
yeah, so there are, um, you know, multiple other constraints that you can apply. Um, I'm not aware of a surface area one, but there is a volume constraint. Uh, so you could limit it to a certain amount of volume. Um, you can also um, cut your part up into multiple, multiple volumes, um, which I did in this case. Um, you kind of see in the upper left corner, um, you see some different colored elements. So each of those are separate volumes. So by cutting up your part into um, multiple volumes, and then you can tell, again, um, which of those volumes you actually want to optimize. So um, you can exclude certain volumes um, from your optimization. So you might be able to get to um, a surface area constraint um, by using sort of a combination of those techniques. Um, you can certainly, again, um, use displacement as one of the constraints. Um, reaction force is a constraint. Um, obviously stress, um, both in terms of global stress, like I used here, but you can also enforce um, stress at a, a, a local location, a, a more uh, local location as well. <clears throat> and then uh, there's also uh, several other, you know, geometric constraints that I've mentioned, you know, you can enforce symmetry about a plane and um, a few others like that. All right, well, those appear to be all the questions. I'll, again, I'll leave it open for another minute or so. so um, or, sorry, I'm working with two different clocks right here. So um, leave it open for another, you know, three to five minutes. But uh, uh, thank you, Matt, for taking the time to, to present. I uh, always appreciate seeing, you know, actual use case rather than uh, just a functionality summary uh, from me. Um, and uh, thank you everybody for attending. Uh, any other questions, let us know. Again, everyone gets a, you should get a, a link to the recording plus uh, a PDF version of the uh, presentation material. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and end the presentation. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. Have a good one.